This episode was made possible by Skillshare, home to over 20,000 classes that could help teach you a new life skill. Humans are really, really good at killing each other. For thousands of years, we've come up with more and more efficient methods of wiping our enemies off the map. The invention of the atomic bomb was seen as a turning point, a moment in history where people stopped and thought, maybe this isn't such a good thing. Unfortunately, it was too late to turn back. We had opened Pandora's box, and even now, years after humanity stood at the brink of total destruction during the Cold War, we have huge stockpiles of nuclear weapons ready to be launched at a moment's notice. However, with recent talks of denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, things are beginning to look up, knock on wood. If North Korea did decide to give up their nukes, and other countries decided to follow suit, what would happen? We can't exactly just leave these things in a big pile somewhere. What do we do with thousands of the most destructive weapons ever devised? On the bright side, there are actually far fewer nuclear weapons in the world's stockpiles than there have been in the past. During the fear and uncertainty of the Cold War, the world's nuclear arsenal had snowballed to almost 64,500, mostly thanks to the standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union, neither wishing to be outgunned by the other. Thankfully, we avoided extinction and have since dismantled or retired a large portion of these doomsday weapons, mostly from the American and Russian stockpiles, and we now only have to worry about 15,000 of them. So, what do we do with unwanted nukes? There are currently two official actions a nation can take to reducing their nuclear stockpile. First, there's retirement. This is a more temporary solution, as the weapons aren't completely taken apart, but rather kept in a storage facility for a rainy day. They are no longer part of the official arsenal, but they still exist in a very real way. The way retirement typically works is that the warhead, the actual scary bit of the weapon, is removed from its delivery system, after which other so-called limited life components such as tritium bottles and neutron generators are separated from the bombs, and the remaining warhead assembly is stuffed in a depot somewhere to await complete destruction. Or not. The second, more definitive option is complete dismantlement, which can be rather tricky. Depending on whether the weapon is powered by uranium or plutonium, nations have to take different courses of action to render the weapons inoperable or safe for other, less destructive applications. In the United States, nuclear warhead dismantlement takes place at the Pantex plant located in the Texas Panhandle. The warheads are taken to an underground bunker, where they're carefully taken apart. Some of the valuable metals, such as gold and copper, are then recycled, and the high explosive components are incinerated, and the resulting ash shipped to an EPA-approved disposal site. The uranium-bearing components are then shipped to another location in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uranium is a naturally occurring element that's enriched to form the heart of many nuclear weapons. The nice thing about uranium is, despite its potential for incredible destruction, it does have tamer uses. The weapons-grade uranium from dismantled warheads can be mixed with lower-grade uranium to make it ready for use in civilian nuclear power plants, where it can use its powers for good instead of evaporating entire cities. Plutonium, on the other hand, is just bad news all around. As of right now, aside from powering a handful of space probes, there's not a single use for plutonium besides as a component in nuclear weapons. It can't be broken down or blended into a safer form, which means it's always ready to be used in a nuke. Unlike uranium, plutonium is not naturally occurring, but it does require less of it to make a functioning bomb, which is why it's sometimes seen as the preferable ingredient in nuclear weapons. Even separated from its delivery system, plutonium will remain dangerous for a very long time. Its half-life, the time it takes for half of its radioactive material to decay, is 24,100 years. Radioactive contaminants are dangerous for 10 to 20 times their half-life, meaning plutonium in the environment today will be a risk for the next half a million years. In order to best mitigate the risk of our existing plutonium, the only real solution we've found is to bury it underground in special containment facilities and ignore it for the rest of time. It will never be truly safe, but it's the best we can do while keeping it on Earth. But what about off-Earth? Many people wonder why we can't just load our radioactive material into rockets and blast them into the sun. It sounds nice in theory, but think about that for a moment. Who in their right mind would want to be anywhere near that launch pad? What happens if the rocket malfunctions and crashes, or blows up high in the air and scatters radioactive material for miles? Not a good day, to say the least. If we did manage to get the rocket into space, it would actually be more difficult to send it into the sun than it would be to set it on a course out of the solar system. Okay, so send it into deep space. Technically, it's possible, but it would be exponentially more expensive than something like sending it into low Earth orbit. We're talking many, many tens of billions of dollars. Then there's the legal dilemma of the fact that no one country owns space, meaning everyone would have to agree on the plan and then the ethical dilemma of what might happen to some poor, unsuspecting planet at some far distant point in the future. 
So really, the best case scenario is rehabilitating all our uranium to be used in civilian power plants, carefully storing all our existing plutonium deep underground in uninhabited areas and throwing away the key, and never producing another nuclear warhead ever again. Is that a likely reality? Maybe, maybe not. But we've already made great strides in reducing the world's nuclear stockpile, and the future looks brighter with every treaty signed and every agreement reached. If there's anything we humans are good at, it's learning from our mistakes and learning in general, specifically with Skillshare. If you want to learn a new skill to market yourself, start a YouTube channel like I did, or just become a better version of you, I highly recommend you check out Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators, with over 20,000 classes in graphic design, business, technology, and more. I'm actually in the process of creating my own Introduction to Photography course, which will hopefully be ready in the next few weeks, so stay tuned. A premium membership gives you access to tons of awesome classes that can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and help you do the work you love. Join me and the millions of other students on Skillshare today with a special offer just for you guys. You can get your first two months of Skillshare for free by signing up using the link below. So if you want access to over 20,000 classes to start learning your awesome new skill, make sure to visit Skillshare by following the link below. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing and clicking the bell to support the channel. If you're not sure what to watch next, check out these playlists full of other great content. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.